I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with Annie Beecham, the production designer on the new film Swan Song. So this film has a very unique concept. It's about a man who is dying, who decides to go about cloning himself for the benefit of his family. Uh, very heavy. Uh, what was the initial component that you connected with in the beginning that made you want to sign on to the film? Well, I think for me, the first read of the script is a really um, instinctive and nuanced process where I try and think more about the subtext under the story and the characters and let that bubble up. So um, I really read it in quite an emotional way. And the script, to me, was is a very nuanced love letter from a husband to his wife. And the science fiction setting or the near future setting is really the envelope for this beautiful story. And it really, um, I felt the design on this film could really elevate and visually advance the emotion and the intimacy and those kind of special moments um, and be a backdrop to um, really enhance the incredible performance of Mahershala who has to play two roles in the movie yeah yeah and he's great in both characters I suppose you could say um but it's set in the future but it still has some recognizable aspects from our present I guess you could say but with a lot of technological advancements too I'm just curious what the initial discussions were with uh, Benjamin Cleary the director for just how to approach the design of the film it was an incredibly you know fortunate opportunity to design the future and I started to think um, for example after talking to Ben researching about quantum um, computing, uh, how we, we talked a lot about the modern aspects of say DETA RAMs and how, for example, our life is connected and disconnected, our connections through technology, that was very important. And the human aspect of the seduction of like your day-to-day um, technology keeps you so busy and touching it and and you know it's very a personal uh, tactile object so we wanted to have that human quality to the tech and then expand on that in the lab for example with the led screen that wasn't originally in the script but ben and i talked about having maybe this ability to hark back to other films like how ever so slightly in kubrick's film or have a a, a kind of a feeling that you have this innate uh, intelligence from something more um, smarter than a human, if you like, but not having that emotional quality. So that LED screen became a very important also technical component in the film where we could then manipulate it through the DP with lighting. And it was very influenced by one of my favorite artists, James Terrell and Oliver another artist so it was a beautiful sweeping moment where we felt we could enhance the story with the design again yeah absolutely and there are actually a number of very interesting technological elements like the ear pods and like the contact lenses that he takes out that like sort of connect to the table I think and just a lot of very sleekly designed mm -hmm. vehicles I was hoping you could talk about the actual physical process of designing those more tactile elements. Again, it starts off with a huge amount of research and a friend of mine is really concerned with closed loop sustainability. So in our new future and our technology, we really, um, I wanted to always take the approach with the design philosophy and to sharpen the visual threads to do less is more in combination with um, using maybe, so, so for example, the, the contact lenses go onto a plate, but the plate is designed in, um, to be made out of recycled plastics from the ocean. And 
an ex-architect and product designer friend of mine is doing Bakelite containers that are recycled plastic. So I was looking at the research, say, at BC University with their packaging using mushrooms instead of um, packaging instead of styrofoam. So it was always coming back to a reality that what we have here, pushing it to, you know, possible 20 years ahead. And also keeping in the philosophy of good design. Yeah, I think you definitely accomplished that here. And especially yeah. in the, uh, the treatment facility as a location, I think is a very big showcase here. Uh, before we delve into the sort of interior scenes, um, how did you just go about finding the right building, the right exteriors for that location? It was a really funny process with the Arrow Lab. It was designed first within the lab. So instead of finding usually as a production designer and with the director of photography and the, the director, you, you will scout locations and you'll start developing the visual language of the film, often in that process of lookbooks. And I often draw on photographers and artists and but with the lab it was really interesting it was a, a slightly different process with Ben he loves being very involved and I wanted to support him through the process wholeheartedly so he um, for example with the lab I wanted to evoke a sense of unspoilt beauty and timelessness and minimalism but at the same time wanting to create a gallery space feel and somewhere like a therapy room, but also have the lab feel like a space where you could um, be like a hospice and go to spend your final hours. So having it both beautiful and comfortable, but at the same time through lighting changes and the design within, the lighting within the architectural design, then we could play it at, at, at with it also to become more claustrophobic and um, insular. So I was very inf influenced by the architects, one particularly being um, the gentleman who designed the Nordic Pavilion in Venice, Sphirfen, and Peter Zumpfer, who's an incredible architect, as well as Oscar Niemeyer. So, we developed firstly the idea that the whole lab is made from rammed earth, which is a future technology instead of using concrete, which is terrible for the environment. And we would make the themes visually come through the architecture of the lab, like of identity of the many selves, how we connect, how we disconnect, how technology um, can influence us how to play with mortality and also the balance of nature versus man-made. So architecturally, how to represent those themes was by reflections, reflections on top of reflections, windows and frames within frames, and also playing with pairs. So then the production design, the philosophy was always stripping back and stripping back. So the elements there in their most rawest forms. So that to me represented the fragility of life. And, you know, also the rammed earth to me felt like a material that was skin-like and soft and like a cocoon. And so you almost felt like when you were going through the hall, like you were maybe going through a womb. So the levels of the building then for me became like emotional journeys for the characters. So Cameron's going downwards into the lab and that's his emotional journey. But Jack, his clone, is moving upwards. He starts in the basement and goes to the top of the house finally. So he's like a phoenix rising. Um, and the two trees in the courtyard were particularly important to me about, you know, they symbolize life and growth. The roots of these trees grab the earth like we do to life. Like we, I think life and death are quite a cycle. And it's really, about letting go. I mean, the unconditional gift that Cameron gives 
his wife in the movie is unique and and really a gift of love so um the trees you know the also were you know, obviously there beforehand and the labs built around it. So there were, I mean, I mean, it was such a pleasure to be developing this with Ben. It, it was just a dream come true. I mean, I think we built with the supervising art director, Michael Diner, and the set decorator, Shannon. I think we all became in tune with the color palette and the philosophies. We we built this beautiful set on the stage, I feel. It was huge. We um, had the whole basement floor as a build and the whole accommodation period on the top levels of the building were set builds. The middle section when you arrive is a location that we found much later and then applied all the REM earth to. And I think the, the whole design started with a concept art that was something that we just made, I made the world from, from scratch, I guess. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, so that's incredible. Like I'm just listening to your explanation of it. It sort of all connects with watching it sort of just not even really picking up on those things, but sort of feeling it naturally, like this idea of life and death and sort right. of like, <laughs> yeah. Cause it, you're right. Like moving through the halls, there's something very natural, but also a little bit like eerie to it at the same time like is this the right exactly. thing so yeah exactly, so yeah. um yeah. another thing I wanted to ask is about the visual effects element of creating this futuristic world it's still making it sort of feel kind of seamless um I imagine that must have been a challenge in general I'm actually wondering how you came up with the design for those screens like the LEDs and the even like when there's the phone and the that's popping out sort of three-dimensionally like the visual effects element on top of everything else the beauty of working with Ben Cleary is that he is very literate visually and I've felt like I became like a catalyst, a revolving door for Ben. So my job as a production designer is to, I feel, elevate the actors to create a background for their, their performances. So I don't distract too much from them and that they can really sing through the frame and carry the emotion that you need to tell a good story. And with Ben being visually quite literate, I. I, I, at times he'd almost send me in to do things for him when he got quite busy and to have him allow me to do that as a filmmaker contribute and has his generosity of spirit to involve me as a film collaborator. Um, I mean, I just bend over backwards for Ben, quite frankly. So, you know, I'd spend a lot of time with these fantastic concept illustrators from Vancouver and Australia and through an enormous amount of research, just keep developing each different AR image and then stripping it back again to the less is more approach and the D to Rams influence. Um, but particularly important doing a lot of research on how the gestures work and how it interacts with you personally, because I think that's where technology is very interesting and seduces us is when we have that human element. And then through the concept frames, which were very particular, we'd give that to our visual effects department. And I was lucky enough to have Ben pretty much call on me through the whole post-production process, which I was happy to offer to do, um, to keep contributing. Yeah. And I'm also just curious about the home that they share together, um, this couple, which is a, a lot more lived in, I would say, but it also does have a certain sleekness to it, a modern design for sure. Um, I was curious what the challenges were in having that home feel like a home, but also then reflecting that futuristic element. At the Turner home, it was... Mm -hmm. Really, for me, the focus was on two things there, which was um, that it's Cameron's point of view. So his point of view, if you imagine, if you're knowing that you're going to leave the earth and your time is to be 
complete it. You, you look at everything with a really acute focus. I don't know if you've ever packed and going on a traveling trip, you know, you're not going to be at home for a while. You, you start really taking notice of things. So there's this slight stylization to the return of home with that in mind and in combination with creating, it's really for me that house is a metaphor for love. So the color palette is interesting because it's in sync with the lab and mirroring the connection forming between Cameron and his duplicate and how he will then, and also it re represents Poppy and Cameron's true love, they're soulmates. So I think that um, for me, that the fact that everything was tactile again and the, they had beautiful art was very important. It was a huge amount of research was taken on the location. Then we built the all the upper floor, the bedrooms and the workspace were studio sets, but the lounge and the kitchen and the garden was a location. And I think hopefully we really created something that showed a loving home. It, it, absolutely, I would say so. Um, and <laughs> just since I have you here, we only have a few minutes left, but I did just want to mention before I let you go, it is the 20th anniversary of a very big movie that you were a part of, <laughs> Moulin Rouge. Um, you were the art director working with Catherine Martin, who actually won the Oscar that for that uh, film. And th that's one of those films where truly, when I think of production design and art direction and set decoration, like that is one of the first that comes to mind. Um, so while I have you here, I was hoping that you could speak to any memories you had of that film that even all these years later managed to stick with you. Moulin Rouge was an incredible 18 month experience where I was looking after all the set construction, scenic art, props, set decoration, drapery team. I think the most incredible moment was watching the dance of the tango to Roxanne in the main hall set and all the dancers in all their costume live on the dance floor singing and dancing with all the cranes. And I thought, I think we might have something here. <laughs> I have not forgotten that night. I mean, that's one of the pleasures of working in the film industry is having these exceptional experiences. I mean, I'm so grateful for being and doing my job, I can't tell you. Yeah, it's an exceptional film. And mm -hmm. this is another one that I think people should check out is Swan Song. So. Um, congrats on your great work here as well. And for those watching, like and subscribe for more interviews and go to goldderby.com to make your Oscar predictions. Um, Annie, thanks so much for your time. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.